morning. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for staying to the bitter end. And thank you. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about how we use satellite uh, data that, or satellite-derived precipitation data to develop an index-based insurance products to address the needs of our client, particularly those clients in the public sector. So I think that many of you have probably seen this graph throughout the week. This shows the economic um, in the darker green and the insured loss in the lighter green from natural and man-made catastrophes between 1970 and 2014. Um, these numbers have been adjusted for inflation. They have not been adjusted for population or asset value growth. And obviously, over the course of the last several decades, these numbers have increased dramatically. You can see some peaks from known weather events. 92, Hurricane Andrew. 1995, floods in North Korea and China. Um, 2005 would be Katrina, Rita, Wilma, and Dennis. 2008 would be Ike, Gustav, and also the earthquake in China. 2011 would be the New Zealand and the Japan earthquake. And finally, in 2001, the 9-11 terrorist attacks. So why? do we focus particularly on developing insurance products for the public sector, at least in my team? No country is ever going to be able to completely insulate itself against natural and man-made catastrophes. There's always going to be some excess risk. And the portion of the risk that is not insured after a large event inevitably becomes the burden of the government. And the government budgets are impacted by um, significant loss events driven by natural catastrophes in two ways. First of all, you have the immediate effects. You have to fund emergency relief efforts, you have to prepare, you have to repair infrastructure very quickly, and you need to address the loss of your building stock and the residents that have been displaced. But then there's also secondary effects which occur over the course of several years to even in some cases several decades. You see decreased economic growth, you have changes to your incoming revenue because some of your building stock is gone and then that thus cannot be taxed. You also have inflation from reconstruction costs. And you can also have costs due to refinancing if you go to the debt markets to issue bonds. So at Swiss Re, we have said the private insurance market is very well established and governments, much like primary insurers can purchase insurance, commercial entities can purchase insurance, you too can transfer some of your natural catastrophe risk into the private insurance market and receive a payout immediately after an event to help fund some of the costs that you are inevitably going to incur after the event. So in the case of the government products or the public sector products, we typically use parametric or what's referred to as index-based insurance. And index-based insurance settles on the characteristics of the event as opposed to the characteristics of the actual loss. And the reason for that is there's actually several reasons that governments mostly prefer to go this route. First of all, if you have a traditional insurance policy, for example, a car insurance policy, and you get into a car accident, the money that you receive from your insurance payout is meant to replace or repair the damage to your car. In the case of an index-based insurance product, the funds are not necessarily earmarked or delineated to have to do anything. The government can deploy them as they see fit. Also, in the case of a traditional insurance policy, you have to send claims adjusters out and the losses at times are adjusted. In an index-based insurance policy, because you're settling on the characteristics of an event, the payout can be very rapid. Um, for example, if it's a hurricane insurance policy and you're settling on the Saffir Simpson scale of a hurricane, there's very little debate. You rely on what comes out of the National Hurricane Center and that's what settles your parametric insurance product. Um, a corollary of that is that um, the cost of having the claims adjustment is not necessarily reflected in your premium because there's very little of it needed. Um, transparency, traditional insurance products can be at times somewhat complicated to explain the settlement process, um, but parametric triggers are very easy to explain, like I just used the hurricane analogy. Also, um, at the bottom is more considerations for the actual buyer. Um, if you're buying a traditional insurance policy, you're going to be priced based on your risk and the value of what you're insuring, whereas in the case of an index insurance product, you can play with it a little bit more to meet the budget needs of the client. And finally, on a traditional side, if you buy a more expensive car, your policy, pre your premium might go up. In the case of index-based insurance, because you're really only assessing the hazard piece, 
there's, no necess there's not necessarily a reason to adjust for changes in exposure. So the reason that we rely on these satellite-based rainfall products is because excessive rainfall and flooding is the only true global peril. It's a peril that's going to affect almost every populated area in the globe. Numerous events in 2013 and 14 have demonstrated the vulnerability. The Calgary floods, um, Ingrid and Manuel in Mexico, Hurricane Gonzalo, and most recently um, Hagupit in the Philippines. According to a report we issued in 2013, riverine flood has the potential to affect more people in urban areas than almost any other peril. Um, many areas have insufficient or inaccurate um, weather observations. This is particularly true in developing economies. So therefore, we have to rely on remotely sensed or modeled rainfall data to detect excessive rainfall or flood events. Um, to do that, we currently use TRIM. I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide because I'm assuming many of you are familiar with the TRIM. And this is just a very short overview as to how it's developed. First, in the event that um, the government would purchase an insurance product with us and we would define the flood exposure in a given region. And then after an event, we would run the calculation routine to determine a payout. So the first step is to determine the exposure in a flood prone district and that can be almost anything. It could be population, which is what's shown here. It could be infrastructure, agriculture, any exposure that the government wishes. And we just aggregate that to the trim grid cells based on either information from the government or a remotely sensed GIS source. And then we define an event. And an event can be delineated through accumulated precipitation, a month, or any other temporally varying metric. And we try to consider the temporal drive of rain flood. Is it several day events? Is it a monsoon? Here are some examples of event definitions. Um, an excess rainfall event would begin when at least one trim grid cell in the covered area is reporting three day accumulated rainfall in excess of 150 millimeters. It ends when no grid cells meet that threshold. Or a monsoon event might begin on Janu June 1 of, one of a year and end September 30th. So then the next step is to determine the loss. And what we do is during the duration of an event, we determine what's the maximum three-day accumulated precipitation, in this example, that occurs. And that's what we use to determine the loss. And in this case, the three-day accumulation is on day I is the sum of precipitation the day before, the day of, and the day after. So you can see that um, in grid cell number one, Day two, day two accumulated precipitation is 185.07. So then we determine what this is across the entirety of the covered area. And this is just kind of a spatial way of looking at it. And then we determine what the loss is. So we will develop what's referred to as a vulnerability curve, which relates the intensity of an event to the percent of exposure that's affected to determine what the loss is per grid cell. And this is just a table showing that. So in grid cell one, you have a, we just said, population of 153,000. The maximum rainfall to occur during an individual event was 204.48. Um, the percentage impacted was 1.23%, so the affected population is just under 1,900. And then we sum it over all the grid cells in the affected area to get what the total affected population or the total affected exposure from this particular event would be. And then we apply the insurance conditions, and this is an example of a payout table. So in this case, um, the index values are normalized by 10 million for this example. And the affected population for this particular event, sample event, was calculated as 5.3 million people, which is greater than 2 million. So the government in this particular scenario would have received 1,000 currency units of payout to help them address their recovery costs after the event. Um, there are pros and cons of this particular solution. Um, the pros are is that the satellite-based precipitation allows for us to develop these products in areas that have poor on-the-ground weather observations. Um, the exposure base is very flexible. As I said, you can use population, agriculture exposure, indus industrial exposure. Um, we have a globally homogenous high-resolution data set, so we can develop products consistently from country to country. Um, the historical availability of the real-time trim data back to 2000 allows us to price and settle on the exact same data. Um, the data availability in real-time from a public website allows for very transparent, a very transparent settlement and claims process and allows us to do it quickly. Um, and the approach will also be applicable to the replacement for the trim, which is the GPM. 
Um, there are some cons. Right now, TRIM takes snapshots of precipitation every three hours. So in some areas which are prone to very um, quick shots of rain which produce flash flooding, some very short duration events could be missed. Uh, GPM will hopefully narrow this problem a little since it'll be higher temporally resolution. Um, we can't consider in this particular case, with this particular product, um, antecedent or runoff patterns, meaning that you could have a moderate rainfall event that occurs over saturated ground that causes damage but does not produce a payout. Um, right now, this really protects against local rainfall flooding only. It can't account for anything upstream and uh, subsequent downstream discharge. In very large geographies, we don't delineate between weather systems. Um, and finally, the current lifetime of the trim is unknown, and the GPM historical iMERGE back to 2000 will not be available, at least until quarter one of 2016. Um, we are looking into other alternatives to address this. Very quickly, I'm going to go through a case study of where we actually have this product deployed in the Caribbean with the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility, also known as the CRIF. So the CRIF was originally developed in 2007 to provide the 16 English-speaking Caribbean countries plus Haiti um, hurricane and earthquake insurance policies. Um, momentum really came after hurricane. Ivan went through Grenada and caused a lot of damage. The policies provide the governments with an immediate injection of cash um, that is caused by events that occur at a 1 in 15 return period and higher. Um, member, uh, member countries, based on their budgets and what they deem as their potential expenditures, can decide what they want in, um, during the policy year, up to 100,000, up to 100 million dollars. Um, the mechanism is triggered by the intensity of an event as it goes over a country. Um, the traditional CRIF policy has already responded numerous times, uh, 2007, 8, and 10. In 2010, Haiti received a full event, a full payout after the earthquake that impacted it, and it was the first injection of capital into Haiti after the event occurred, and it also allowed the Haitian government to continue to fund their police force and continue recovery efforts. But one of the things that the CRIF noticed over the uh, several years that it has already been incepted is that there is a gap in protection because there is no there was no excess rainfall a country could be hit by a tropical cyclone but if it was a tropical storm it might not trigger the wind trigger the wind trigger the hurricane is wind and storm surge only so in 2014 we added a third peril, which is the excess rainfall, and eight of the 16 countries purchased it. The losses are determined on two-day rainfall totals and the country's exposure values, so they're residential, commercial, and industrial. Um, we use the trim enhanced by a modeling firm called Kinanko, Kinetic, Analysis Corp Kinetic Analysis Corporation, to downscale the trim to a one kilometer by one kilometer database. Um, the CRIF retains the first 2.5 million of loss, and we provide reinsurance above 2.5 million to, with a limit of 32.5 million. Um, and the solution really does, as I said, we use a technology that can be replicated globally. And the product, even though it's brand new, has already proved its weight this year. Um, it has paid out about $3 million already to three different countries. And you can see the um, countries and the events that it paid out after. In 2014, CRIF announced plans to expand into the Central American countries. And this product is highly beneficial for the Central American countries. Their tropical cyclone risk is relatively minimal compared to the Caribbean. Belize is actually already a member country of the CRIF. Earthquake risk is high, but powerful earthquakes are fairly infrequent events. So if you look at what's really going to drive their um, high frequency losses, it's going to be rainfall. And an example is Hurricane Mitch in, in 1998 in Honduras. It killed over 18,000 people in Honduras and Nicaragua and caused $4.8 billion in 1998 dollars at the time. The losses of Hondur in Honduras due to Hurricane Mitch were 73% of that country's GDP this year. So it's critical to provide the Central American countries with a rainfall product as well. And thank you very much. Um, I wanted to put more contact information up there, but forgot. But should you want to follow us on Twitter, a lot of us tweet internally about different insurance products, so please feel free. Thank you.